Hey everybody, this is Rob Keynes from goldsilverpros.com. And today I'm gonna to do a special get away from the type of analysis we usually do on the channel to talk about a very special event, the 50 year anniversary, which is coming up in two days on August 15th. And this will be a, a Friday night special for you guys. We're gonna talk about Nixon taking the US off the gold standard. That means taking the convertibility of the US dollar, the paper currency off of convertibility to gold, the events that led up to it, what he did and what the repercussions have been since 1971 in many areas of our society. And what we think also, we'll have a little bit of discussion what we think can happen going forward after the 50th anniversary and what it really means because it is such a huge event in monetary history. Not only did Nixon take the dollar off the gold standard, but effectively the world went off the gold standard because the dollar was a reserve currency of the world. And that led to huge amounts of exporting inflation and changes in our culture and society that I want to talk about. And I'm going to start with the announcement that Nixon made on doing this. We'll get right to, to that. It was so impactful and so amazing. I think at the time, people didn't even know how much of an impact this was going to make. Let's listen to his announcement from almost 50 years ago, April 15th. I'm sorry, August 15th, 1971. Richard Nixon closes the bill window. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Now, what is this action, which is very technical? What does it mean for you? Let me lay to, re lay to rest the bugaboo of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car, or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American-made products in America, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. The effect of this action, in other words, will be to stabilize the dollar. Okay, I wanted to comment there he's basically full of crap in a lot of ways. There's three main points I want to make. The first one was they're defending the U.S. dollar from speculators overseas. Now, the U.S. dollar was convertible to gold. The reason why the, the French and a lot of European nations were trading in their dollars for gold was because the United States had printed more dollars and not increased the amount of gold. They were lying to the rest of the world. Here's the world reserve currency from Bretton Woods. The background you see on the screen was from the Bretton Woods conference where this whole scheme was dreamed up. Go back the dollar, the U.S. was responsible for the rest of the world to peg the gold to the dollar and keep it stable and not print excess dollars, which would then export inflation to other nations. Didn't do that. Excess dollars were printed, exported to other nations. They got pissed off and finally called us on it, sent all of the dollars back and redeemed it for gold. We drained over 60% of gold reserves were drained from that, deservedly so because the U.S. had overprinted. And so that's when Richard Nixon... I had to make an emergency declaration to stop convertibility of the dollar into gold because they knew we weren't going to have any gold left. We'd already lost most of the gold that, that we had built up over the intervening years from World War II to 1971. And so it was the U.S. politicians and the central bank and the treasury that were all involved in overprinting the dollar and devaluing it against gold. And the rest of the world did what they should have done. They, they called our lies out and they converted it in, the dollar back into gold and, and stole the gold. So it had nothing to do with international speculators. It had to do with the U.S. lying, not only to the American public, but to the rest of the world as to how they were devaluing the dollar against gold. The second thing was Richard Nixon saying he's going to end convertibility of the dollar into gold, except for in certain circumstances that basically the government deemed necessary. Now, there has been a... Um, a lot of speculation and intelligent speculation based upon facts and news events that the U.S. has leased out a lot of its gold from the central bank. It no longer has those 8,100 how many ever tons. It's been leased out. And whether we get it back, you know, because gold can be remelted and shuffled around, 
it is anybody's guess. But think about this and something that's been less talked about. Nixon said, ends convertibility of dollar to gold unless it supports the interest you know, of the United States and the dollar, meaning certain parties could still have exchanged their dollars for gold. And we may have actually had less than the 8,000 tons that the US was reporting because certain parties, if they brought the dollars, could have got gold. Now, who could that be? Certain interested parties that the state wanted to support. I don't know. So that was key in his, in his address that a lot of people didn't pick up on. Yes, we were le- we believe we were leasing our gold after 1971. So we don't have as much as, as we stated. And we haven't had an audit since like the 50s or something. So nobody really knows how much we have. But in certain cases where it was deemed in the interest of the United States and support the dollar, people could still redeem their dollars for gold. Maybe they can still do it, you know, well, not today, but up to a certain period of time. So we don't know who could have gotten some of that gold, you know, right after 1971. Maybe certain interested parties that the the, the government wanted to could still have gotten the gold. The third piece of this was the ending piece, which is a, a big load of malarkey, which I'll prove wrong here in a second, was that Americans spending on American goods, you know, would still be able to buy the same thing as we came off the gold standard. Well, that's not true for two reasons. One, the dollar has plummeted in value against any basket of goods, whether made in the U.S. or otherwise. And two, we exported most of our manufacturing. So we're not buying stuff in the U.S. anymore. And they didn't tell you that was going to happen in the 80s when you did this in 1971. And it was largely a result of this decision in 1971, which caused us to export all of our manufacturing overseas because of the way they printed the dollars and artificially boosted the quote unquote wealth here in the United States. What they're really doing is exporting inflation. And so we had to export, our prices were high here. So they, they had to export and manufacturing elsewhere to save money to, uh, to smaller economies. But I wanna show you a chart as to why what he said was a lot of malarkey. And you should be careful listening to your, to your government and your politicians. Here's the inflation calculator, usinflationcalculator.com. A dollar in 1971, uh, you would have to have $6.74 in 2021 to equal the value of a dollar in 1971, meaning it's fallen by a factor of 574.1%, or we've had 574.1% inflation, which is about an average of 11% a year. Okay. So did the dollar maintain its purchasing value? No, obviously not. So was Nixon correct? No, obviously he was not correct. Well, let's look at it from statista.com. I've graphed out 1971 to 2020. Look at the purchasing power of the dollar it's down by almost a factor of seven times. It's the same thing as this, just presented in graphical format. We're down almost seven times. Or in other words, if you have a dollar now, it would have been worth, or if, I'm sorry, if you had a dollar in 1971, it would have been worth almost seven bucks now. Almost exact same thing we see here, 674, same thing. So any which way you look at it, graphical form or conversion form, the dollar decidedly did not keep its value, okay? That's the problem with a pure fiat system and which is not backed by gold because that's some economic stuff. What about, what about some other things? Let's, there's a really good video put out by the Daily Reckoning about this and how they talked about how Nixon killed the U.S. dollar and a lot of the, the reasons why and the, and the aftermath after. I think it's really good. So let, let's play this video. It goes about three and a half minutes. Well worth it, guys. Pay attention to what they say here. Monetary sanity convertibility had been restored in Europe in 1959, and almost immediately thereafter, the United States began running enormous balance of payments deficits year in and year out. Bretton Woods established an arrangement whereby, supposedly from 1945 and the end of the war onward, all currencies were convertible to the dollar and the dollar to gold. At that time, gold reserves were the final mechanism for settling balance of payments deficits. But Bretton Woods forestalled this process by permitting the sole reserve currency, the main reserve currency, to be considered as official reserves for foreign central banks such that they could settle all their their deficits in dollars as opposed to gold. That's the fundamental difference between the classical gold standard and what is called the gold exchange standard which Bretton Woods enshrined in law and in treaty. When we were spending more money abroad than we were taking in, all the foreign countries, uh, especially in Europe and in Japan, absorbed these dollars pouring into their economies and they held them in their reserves. 
they immediately take those dollars and reinvest them in the New York money market. Thus, the Americans, were, I should say the American government, um, were able to buy abroad and buy at home at the same time. And gradually, this vast foreign exchange component built up as a claim against gold. And in 1971, both Britain and several other countries decided to encash their huge accumulations of dollar reserves under the Bretton Woods system for gold. And of course, uh, President Nixon, in his own way, decided to trump them. George says, as long as we do not have convertibility, he says, the Europeans can't do all that much to us. They can't. Because he says, when we had convertibility, then they had a right to lecture us about That's what right. we ought to do. But That's with correct. convertibility, uh, without convertibility, uh, that that is not the case. These countries had the right to claim gold to redeem their dollar reserves. It would put the United States in a position of insolvency. We just shouldn't get all that excited about the yeah, fact probably. that they worry about our budget. Is that your view? That's exactly right. They can't do one cockeyed thing. And they'll say, oh, well, we've got to maintain our relations. We've asked them to hold dollars. And I said, no, we didn't ask them to hold dollars. They've held dollars. It's been in their interest to hold dollars. That's right. And I said, to hell with them. I am. I'm not worried about right. them. I'm worried about us. That's right. Uh, 19, 1960s was filled with financial crises that involved the dollar, but the total collapse came in 1971. He issued an executive order on August 15, 1971, and said, I'm sorry, we're not paying our debts. We're certainly not paying our debts in gold. All right, so essentially, there's a couple of things there. The crisis of the 60s led to 1971. So the crisis of the 60s had to do with the dollar, the overprinting of the dollar. In 1971, they had end convertibility. And that also during the 1960s is when European other nations came and basically took gold through the convertibility. That's why they had to stop it. They were bleeding gold. And they needed to go on a pure fiat system because the gold standard was going, it, the, the, pulling of gold away from the U.S. was going to expose the gold standard and how the U.S. is overprinting dollars. And that's essentially what happened. Um, very interesting information there. Want to go back and talk about, you know, ramifications. So we've got one of the ramifications of when we went to the pure fiat system. In other words, since 19, I've got a graph here from 1970, 2018. So it's pretty close to when we came off the gold standard. And we, we can look and see that the, the, the middle class's share of the income fell from 62% to 43% in 2018, or 43%, I'm sorry. That's almost 20%. So who got robbed when we went to a pure fiat system? It was the middle class. The lower income, they lost a percent, about the same. The middle class got robbed for the upper class. When we went to the dollar and off the gold standard, the, the upper class, which invests in, in, in most of the investments in which the dollar would inflate, like the stock market and real estate values and other things, earned all of the income. But the inflation killed the middle class, a lot of which cannot invest in a lot of those things, at least not to the level of the, the upper class, and, and definitely not in percentage terms and not in raw dollar terms. So the, the, the middle class got slammed by inflation. Does inflation affect the lower classes, the upper? Sure, but when you have the upper income, the upper class can live with inflation because it's being offset by the rise of the dollar pushing up their assets like the stock market and real estate values. The, the, the lower class gets subsidized by government programs, which comes out of the middle class income. So that's why it hasn't fallen quite as much. Now it is harder on the, on the lower class, but it's the, the middle class which got destroyed there. That's the repercussion of moving off of the gold standard to um, a pure fiat system. And I'm going to get further into that. All these other tabs here in my browser, I'm going to talk about societal implications. So this is not really a video as much on economics as is when you change monetary systems, how it affects people in the real, in the real world. And that's the significance of this 50 year anniversary of Nixon taking us off the gold standard or the Bretton Woods convertibility standard in 1971. Here's a good video on wealth inequality in America. It's longer at six minutes, but it's a perfect graph, graphical representation of exactly what's happened in much more detail than here that I think you guys need to see. And then we'll move from 
the economic impacts into the societal and cultural impacts right after this video. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution, and 92% that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. 
And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money. But do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. All right, so that's a really cool video. By the way, it's free to copy and distribute uh, all the stuff. I have here is it's it's used for educational purposes but the cool thing about that video is it talks about what people think is reality what we would like to see as a whole when we come together and talk about it and what the reality is and that video was done in 2012 and we know in the last nine years it's gotten worse meaning more of the wealth has skewed right to to the richest segments of society and again when you got off the gold standard is when all of this happened so the idea they had at Bretton Woods to make the dollar the reserve currency and give America, Americans, politicians and, and, the, and the banking system all that power ended up being a catastrophic decision for Americans. You know, this uh, 70, 80 years later, it's, it's been horrible. And especially the last 50 years, it's been it's been god awful. The, the, the intent of this system failed and it failed relatively quickly and it's got nothing but worse and worse and worse for for most Americans. And there are monetary consequences we have talked about. I want to talk about some of the other consequences as well. Uh, first, we want to look at household debt to GDP from, from 1970, about right here. You know, in, in, the, in the 50s and, and 60s, it increased. And then we reached a nice little plateau here. And then 1971 to about 1976, 77, and then it got worse. So right after Nixon stopped convertibility of the dollars into gold. It was okay from a debt perspective. And then it exploded and it's never really stopped. Now it did come down from right after the financial crisis till about now, but it's starting to trend back up. Why? Because we had the shutdowns last year, it's getting worse. So households tried to pay down their debt in, in the 10 years from you know the financial crisis to, well, actually in about the 11 years from financial crisis till we had the shutdowns. And, and, and tried to do it and got it down from about 100% of debt to GDP, but now it's back over 80%. Still, still very high, historically speaking. And when that happens, when you have so much debt, a lot more of your money is going to service the debt and the interest on that debt. In other words, making it impossible for the poor and the middle class really ever to get out of the situation they're in. And what has that led to? Here on Wikipedia, we have a nice little chart from 1920 to about 2014 incarcerated Americans. Look at right after we ended the convertibility of the dollar to gold. And, and remember, since the Bretton Woods system here, it's gone up. So even though we had a gold standard, when the US is overprinting and you had these dollar crises in the 60s that we saw on that day of the reckoning video, the incarcerated went up, but it really exploded after 1971, literally right after 1870, 1971, after we removed the gold standard discipline of the dollar, and started printing, 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 you had much more crime. You had many more incarcerated Americans. Why? Because less Americans can make ends meet. And I'm gonna show you something here in a moment, which shows the destruction of families. It's really gonna, really gonna blow your mind. When you have the destruction of the American family, an American farm, the American business, the small business, what do people turn to? They turn to theft. Theft has exploded. Violent crime, not so much in the last 10, 20 years, but thefts have exploded since 1971. And that's why people are either in prison or jail or juvie detention. Look at the amount of juveniles. I mean, the incarceration of juveniles or the, or the, the suspension of rights in juvenile detention of juveniles has exploded. But the overall population is just ridiculous in terms of the millions. 
that, that's a big number. And here, a, a study historical data on uh, crime rates. So we're gonna go down to a nice little chart we see. After 1971, crime rate peaks really peaked in terms of per 100,000. Um, this is prior to, this is after peak. So it went down from the Great Depression through World War, it was going down. Then Bretton Woods, boom, then up. And then Vietnam War. And here's the arrest rate from 65 to 98. So this study only goes to the late 90s. But look at this. Right after convertibility, boom. So it was, right, it was fine until Bretton Woods. It was going down. A, a lot of this had to do with the military and people you know, working in the military and working in the economy to support the war. But then right after Bretton Woods went up and then after suspending convertibility dollar went way up. Drug arrest, particularly, this is drug arrest particular. So people are using drugs. They're being incarcerated in, in record amounts. This is what's happened to society. Prison population, an, another study here from 25 through about 71, and then boom, it explodes through the, the 90s. The prison population exploded. Now population did go up, but that's a near inverted. Look at it, this is a near inverted increase more than the population, going up more than the population. So here is the peak drafts of the Vietnam War. And then after, boom, here's suspending the convertibility of the dollar. And then boom, look at the prisoners through the 90s. Just ridiculous. And they had to release a bunch of people, conditional releases, because there were too many people in the prison system. See, th this, this issue that we've had with, with so many people in the prison system didn't really exist until after World War II, but especially until after we got off the gold standard. So starting from the Bretton Woods system until we got off the gold standard is when the prison population exploded. Now we're doing capital punishment. Now we're killing more people in the prison systems. Look at that increase. Prisoners executed. So less than actually executed, but more of them on death row. What about divorce rate? Now this is going to be an interesting study because Overall, since 60 to 2019, divorce rate fell to a 50-year low in 2019. So that would seem to indicate we've got less divorces. Well, that's not too bad. But wait until you see why. The way that affect the family wasn't in the sheer number of divorces, in the fact people never got married in the first place. The marriage rate reaches an all-time low in 2019. Look at this. 85.9% of people were married in 1970. At the time, convertibility of the dollar into gold ended in 1971. It's fallen, not quite a third, maybe about 40% of, of that. So people aren't getting married anymore. That's why divorce rate's down. Divorce rate is not down because people are living happier lives. Okay, look at the slope of this line. The divorce rate's down because nobody's getting married. The marriage divide is widening. College educated, and, and listen to the details of this study. College educated, economically better off Americans are more likely to marry and stay married. Well, duh, they have better economic prospects. But working class and poor Americans face more family instability and higher levels of singleness. For Americans in the top third income bracket, 64% are in an intact marriage, meaning they have only married once and are still in the first marriage. In contrast, only 24% of Americans' lower third income have an intact marriage. What's worse, all signs point to continuing downward trend for new marriages on top of already record high share of never married adults. Americans are postponing the marriage because of the pandemic. This is 2020. The initial state level data. And, and when you have an economic situation, this is what happens. It destroys new families. What's that going to do to birth rates and kids and growth of the economy in the future? The demographics are going to change. The initial state level data suggests that a dramatic decline in marriage certificates filed during the COVID-19 crisis. Given they can't afford a wedding and not having a stable job ranked high in the reasons why singles are not married. As reason will predict that fewer singles will tie the knot. The sobering news puts a, puts a damper on our hope for future American families. With the rates of both divorce and marriage dropping in America, we expect to see the marriage divide deepen and poor working class American increasingly disconnected from the institution of marriage. The impact of this disconnection on our family can be destructive, which makes it an issue that policymakers, community leaders, and scholars should continue to pay attention to. That is a cultural impact of Nixon pulling us off the gold standard that he possibly could not have known, at least not to the extent that we see it today. What about homelessness? Here, here's a map of percentage of total homelessness by state. I live in Texas, 4.7 is fairly high. 
Look at the two most liberal socialist states, New York, almost 16% homeless, California, 27.89. Wow. And the overall level of homelessness in the United States has exploded. As a percentage, it's gone up. But in certain areas in which the state has to do more because people can't make ends meet and they can't marry and they're in jail, incarcerated because they have high debt levels, you see an explosion of the homeless population. That's the effect of getting off the Bretton Woods version of the gold standard. And it start, these trends started after Bretton Woods and the dollar was a reserve currency, but gold held it in check until people figured out that the United States had printed too much money. The effect had started when the United States printed too much money and lost the pure discipline of gold as money when compared directly with the dollar. Then they said dollar convertibility to gold, but they increased dollars more than gold. You started to see all of these cultural and societal problems, the wealth gap, the divorce issue, stuff like that. But then in 1971, when they went pure fiat, all of that exploded, the, the negative effects upon our society. Is it any wonder that we have riots? Is it any wonder that people are sad and depressed and suicides and stuff like that? Is it any wonder that people can't make ends meet? Is it any wonder that people can't retire? Look at the stock market and look at real estate prices. People still can't retire because the valuations of those have not gone up with as much as the effect of the dollar devaluation has. So when you look at the stock market real estate prices now, you think, oh, I'm doing well. No, not when considered over time. And what that does is it destroys family. More people get into drugs. More people go to jail. Less marriages. Less happy families. A direct effect on American society. One of the reasons I did this video is because we're in an inflection point. And I said this on uh, Chris Marcus's show last night, uh, Arcadia Economics, with uh, also Andy Shankman and Miles Franklin was there. We were talking about, are we at an inflection point, given that in two days we have the 50-year anniversary of this decision? We've been building up to an inflection point, as you can see by the data that we have. And per what we talked about last night, now you're starting to see all the news around what is going on politically, culturally, with families economically, medically, all of it, it's coming to a head. So historically, currencies, reserve currencies haven't survived past 50 years from being pure fiat. I don't think the dollar has long left when you look at all the signs around us. And so I do think that this, in two days, this anniversary of the ending of the Bretton Woods system and in, in, in pure fiat monetary standard in the US, which was exporting inflation around the world, is going to finally come home to roost in the United States. And you see it geopolitically with the realignment, standing up to America, China and Russia, Belt and Road Initiative, all of those things, de-dollarization, all of that stuff, all those economic things are going to lead to the other things I talked about here, divorce rates, problems with family, drug use, incarcerations, that's going to accelerate even more because it goes like this, it goes up and then really up when you took away dollar convertibility to gold, and then at the ending of the dollar system, it's going to go straight up. My parents grew up in the Great Depression. What they talked about, what had happened during the Great Depression was, was heartbreaking and people died and people didn't have jobs and people starved. That's when most people had strong family units. That's when most people lived on farms or in rural and could do some for themselves. At least they could grow some basic foodstuffs if they had water and fertilizer and labor. Think about it now, most people living in the cities, most people dependent upon stock portfolios and real estate portfolios, which will crash. Most people not having any way to grow their own food. Most people not even being married anymore. Look at, look at the younger classes, the millennials and, and the Gen Zers. How many of them are getting married? Now the Gen Zers are just coming into marriage age, but how many of them have good job prospects? How many of them have record school debt, but not getting jobs in their field, 50%. How many of them are not getting married? How bad is it going to be this time when we have the next financial crisis compared to the Great Depression? When we were stronger families, more self-sufficient, less people on drugs, less people in prison, stuff like that. The cultural effects of this 50-year anniversary, I don't know if we could possibly, possibly quantify those, but I know it's going to be huge. And so that's why I wanted to run the special. I want to talk about some of the other things. We talk about the financial and the economic leg of it, and I did address that in the video. But it goes beyond that. It's to the effect that that has on everything else, on society, on the family, on our happiness, on our children's prospects and their children's prospects, 
on our viability as a nation going forward. And I think leading up to our conference, August 1920, the Money Mental Summit, which you can sign up for below, this is a big event. And, and, and the timing of our conference next week could not be better. You guys have got to come. It's free if you're doing it virtually. If you show up on the first day for that one day, it's only 30 bucks and we buy you dinner. Okay. So your, your costs are defrayed, believe me. My, our costs are going to be higher than that. But we want you there so that we can build a community to talk about these things, to prepare for these things. It goes beyond the gold and the silver and the finances. It goes into how we survive as a nation. And so we want to have that conference to talk about some of this and the impact of this. And we want to start that here. We want to start this video tonight. Please comment in the chat and in the comments below. Let's start that. Okay, this has been the 50th anniversary special of the Nixon decision to end convertibility gold in, a, in an executive order, which is not legal anyway, but in, in any case... <laughs> And the implications of that, let's think about that going forward. Let's talk about it on the channel. Let's talk about the conference. Let's start having those town hall discussions, not just online, but with our families, with our friends locally. Because if we are going to survive what is coming, we need to band together, regardless of race, religion, age, marital status, social status, economic status, it doesn't matter. We're going to have to band together. We're going to have to do this together, guys. Because this is going to threaten the foundations of our nation. I showed you that in the data. The family, freedom, clear thinking, the future of our kids, the, fu the, the future of our nation. That's the implication of the decision first to go to Bretton Woods and allow the U.S. to determine the fate of the world's reserve currency and then the U.S. coming off in 1971. Have to learn from history. We have to, guys, we're going to survive, and we have to plan for what is coming next. And this date, two days from now, August 15th, 2021, is an inflection point. We talked about it last night on KD Economics. We're talking about tonight on our channel, major inflection point, something to think about. It goes way beyond gold, silver, way beyond dollars, way beyond finances. Huge, huge implications. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for today. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. We're doing everyday content till the conference. Uh, Sunday, we got Andy Sheckman. I'm sorry, Saturday, Andy Sheckman. Interview with him. Sunday, I'm doing a retrospective on, on Chris Marcus in preparation for the conference. Monday and Tuesday, I'm doing mining stock reviews. For those of you that love mining stock reviews, about 50% of my audience loves it. So we're doing that. Wednesday, we're going to do a retrospective on my last conversation with Craig Hemke leading up to conference. He'll be at the conference too. So content every single day leading up to the conference this coming Thursday, the 19th. Hope to see you guys there. Hope this was a good conversation piece for you and a good starter for us to start banding together as a society, as a community, to talk about not only the economic ramifications, but what else comes next for us so we can prepare and help each other out. Thanks, guys. Till next time, this is ColdSilverPros.com.